police calling all cars, attention all cars, a bank hold up at 7th and Hoover, police officers shot and killed, and that's all, rolls and quotes. Unless you have had the opportunity to get an insight into the problems of policing your cities and towns, you can never appreciate the most thankless, never-ending job your mind can conceive. Chief Davis, in his modest way, says, it takes brave men, fine equipment, and good gasoline to do a satisfactory job. You have seen and heard police cars, fire engines, motorcycles, and ambulances screaming down the street to aid someone in distress. It takes good gasoline to give them the performance they demand. You have also seen patrol cars or motorcycles driving up one street and down another, hour upon hour. Rigid economy in this branch of city government stipulates economy of operation. When you hear advertising claims of quick starting, pickup, power, mileage, anti-knock, you hope you're getting it in the gasoline you buy. Well, the police car performance you get from Rio Grande Crash includes all these qualities. That is why in the great Southwest, so many police cars, fire engines, motorcycles, ambulances, and other emergency equipment are powered by Rio Grande Crash. Once more, the Rio Grande Oil Company is proud to present Chief James E. Davis, of the Los Angeles Police Department, whose interest in the citizen and taxpayer makes possible these broadcasts. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. There is an axiom in England, as old as England itself, that no matter where a citizen of England is, when he meets death at the hands of an enemy of England society, no force on the face of the earth can keep Great Britain from reaching out and avenging his death. The streets of London are patrolled by uniform bobbies, unarmed with but few exceptions. No firearms are carried by the police of England, for the citizens of that country have a hearty respect for the age-old truism which has reached into Canada, into India, into the British East Indies, into the islands of the Pacific, into Africa, in fact, into all the dominions of Great Britain, that the English police always get their man. Here in America, only recently has public decency been so outraged by the brazenness of the criminal element as to bring to every citizen a realization of how important it is to support the police and peacetime army on a criminal front where battle never ceases. For years, the law enforcement agencies of this country have carried on undaunted under a burden of public disrespect which has made their job the hardest in the world, almost impossible to successfully finish. Until but a few months ago, if a gangster killed a policeman, that was not news. But if a policeman killed a gangster, that was news. News so colored by sentimentalists that a wave of criticism swept over the policeman and his colleagues so overwhelmingly that he not only lost courage, but faith in the citizens whose job it is for him to protect. Tonight's story tells more eloquently than can any words of mine what it means to kill a policeman. It concerns the wanton murder of a guardian of the law by self-styled tough eggs from Texas, unaccustomed, perhaps, to the unceasing vigilance of your police officers. I hope that every citizen listening to this program will realize as he hears this story unfold how important it is for him to back up morally and actually, if necessary, the policeman who risked his very life to protect him, his property, and his family. Professor Lindsley will now go on with the story. In 
February 1924, the police department receives a tip that the Merchants National Bank at 7th and Hoover is spotted for a holdup. Chief of Detectives George K. Holmes details officers Bond and Ford, members of the department's famed crime cluster, an organization of 300 patrolmen working in plain clothes, to stake out of the bank. We join them on February 20th. After several days on the job, he was in a little office at the side of the main banking room. Well, this is a soft one, Forbes. Yep, don't mind it a bit. Two days we've been sitting around here. Well, that's better than shaking down vags. Well, even shaking down vags is better than pounding a beat. Yeah, how do you know? You've only been on the force a couple of months. Six months? Uh, I'll wait until you've pounded a beat as long as I have. And then you'll really know how soft this steak is. Hey, Ford, do you suppose somebody will try to knock over this place? Mm, you never can tell. They seem to have a pretty hot tip at headquarters. What would you do if they did try a job? What would I do? Well, Glenn, that's hard to say. You never know, for instance, what you'll do before you get into an automobile accident. If you manage to do the right thing, or you don't live to tell about it. Yeah, that's right. Well... Police work's the same sort of thing. Yeah, and it's swell. Don't you think so, Forbes? Oh, I don't know. It's a good job. I'll say that much. Yeah, but there's more to it than just that. It's the idea of being a peace officer, keeping the peace, of being on the right side. I get a big kick out of it. Yeah? Well, kid, if you get such a big kick out of it, take a look through the door and see how things are going in the bank. Okay. Say, have you noticed while we were talking, you got awful quiet in there? Yeah, it did at that. Take a look. Right. Get back in there. Forbes, there's a holdup going on out there. There's a guy with a gun. Okay, kid. Here's your chance to be a hero. Unlever your coat and follow me. I said get back in there. Drop that gun. We're police officers. The hell with police officers. Come on, kid. Get it off. The cops are already. That's fast. What's the trouble here? Bank hold up. They could have got away in a red jacket. One was four bottles. One was two. There were three of them. And they headed north on Hoover Street. Oh, one of them was shot. I saw him stand. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't all talk at once. You said they headed north on Hoover? That's right. Yeah, I saw them drive away. Okay. Frank, you take your car and see if you can follow them. Okay. Now, where's the officer that was shot? In my office. I'm the manager of the bank. Will you take me to him, please? Surely. Right inside the door. There are two of them, you know. Both shot? Yes. I've already phoned for the ambulance. Here we are. Right in here. Forbes and Bond. Poor guys. Heard that, Forbes? No. no. I'm okay. Grazed my head. I'll be all right in a minute. You look after the kid. He, he got hit bad. How about a Bond? How are you feeling? Not so good, Lieutenant. He... He got me for, for keeps, I guess. But... Well, I, I did my duty, Lieutenant. I got him. He's... wounded. Look for, for a guy that's... wounded. <laughs> later, Glenn Bond, the police rookie, dies in the receiving hospital without ever regaining consciousness. And with the news of his death, the unwritten law of the police officer begins to work. There is not a man on the force, but who pledges silently to himself to work unceasingly to avenge the death of his brother officer. In his office, Chief of Detective Holm issues orders to a group of officers. Now, from what Forbes has been able to tell us, we know that there were at least three and possibly four men in this gallery. Numbers one and two entered the bank. Three served as the lookout, and four, if there was a fourth, 
drove the red Buick Sport model in which the men escaped. We also know that one of them was wounded. All right. I want every red Buick Sport model in Los Angeles stopped and examined for blood stains or any other evidence that might connect you with the crime. I also want you men to check every drugstore on the left side of town for any suspicious purchases of bandages and antiseptics. Hello. Uh, this is Dr. Watkins speaking. Yes. Is that the chief of detectives? Yes. Well, uh, I just handled a case. I feel I should report to you. Yes? What was it? A uh, revolver wound. The patient said it was accidental, but it sounded suspicious to me. Go ahead. What were the circumstances? Well, this young fellow had a wound that would seem to indicate that the bullet passed through the lung. Yes? After I gave him first aid, I told him that he would have to be removed to the hospital, but he refused to consider it. A man that was with him, who said he was his brother, also claimed it was impossible. I warned him that the wound was serious and it should be treated properly, but the patient still refused to go to the hospital. And I told them I would be forced to report the matter to the police. Mm, what did they say to that? And the patient begged me not to report it. He claimed he shot himself while he was cleaning his gun. But if the police found him, they'd try to hang something on him because he was on parole. I see. Well, that's all there is to it. I suppose it was foolish of me to waste your time about it. On the contrary, Doctor. I think you're helping us more than you know. Uh, where did you treat this patient? It was at a rooming house, uh, 522 South Olive Street. Fine. Thank you very much, Doctor. You're quite welcome, sir. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, what is it, Chief? Something hot? Plenty. Dalton, I want you and O'Connor to go to a rooming house at uh, 522 South Olive Street and find a man there who's suffering from a gunshot wound. Go through the place until you get him. I think he's one of the boys we're looking for. <laughs> The officers conduct a systematic search of the Olive Street rooming house. Followed by a frightened landlady, they come upon a disheveled apartment on the second floor. I hope you gentlemen forgive the appearance of this room. It was just vacated a half an hour ago, and I haven't had time to clean it yet. Just vacated a half hour ago, eh? Smell what I smell like? Yep. And the septic. Let's take a look at the sheets in this bed. Blood. That's what it is, lady. Who rented this room? Why, two brothers. And what were their names? Thomas was their name. Bill and Mark Thomas. Who do you suppose that one of them was hurt? I don't know. But my guess is he was shot by a dead man. What? Eh, oh, nothing, nothing. Where did these Thomas boys go? Well, I, I don't know. But they left here with another fellow in a green top taxi. Oh, come to think of it, Mark Thomas, one of the brothers, did look a little... Uh, anybody you know of that was familiar with them? Well, they didn't know many people. But there was a couple down the street that used to call on them. What was their name? McBride, I think it was. And where do they live? Why, in that hotel just three doors down the street. Okay, lady, and thanks. Come on, Eddie. We'll pay a visit to the McBride. <laughs> Mr. McBride upstairs? No, he ain't. How about Miss McBride? She in? No. Any idea when they'll be back? No, I haven't. Well, we'll wait. Well, you might wait a long time, see? There's no time when they will come back. Yeah? Well, maybe I'll find out quicker if I run that switchboard. Well, what do you mean? You sit over there. I can run a switchboard as well as you can. Oh, you must be nuts. I can't let you do that. Come on, quit stolen. You know who we are. You probably know why we're here. Now, move over there. Make it snappy. I'm the telephone operator for a while. Uh, Mike, uh, you better go up and wait in the room. Okay. Hey, you, which room are the McBrides in? Oh, I don't know. Listen, Sonny, I'm going to lose patience with you in a minute and run you in. Now, which room is McBride? 115. Uh, that's more like it. Let's see. Yeah, uh, here's the key. Go to it, Mike, and ring me down here if they come in the back way. <laughs> Several hours, Dalton fills the position of telephone operator, handling all the routine calls of the house without hearing anything in it. 
Then suddenly a call comes from a stride department. Dalton allows a few seconds to pass and then returns to the phone himself. Hello. Is that you, Les? Yeah. Well, this is Tom. Say, Lou is in bad shape. We've got to do something for him. Well, uh, come on up to the room and we'll talk it over. No, that's too risky. I'm afraid of the bulls. Well, let's see then. I'll tell you. I'll meet you in front of the garage at 4th and Alley's in 10 minutes. Okay, I'll be there. Hello, Mike? Yeah, what's doing? Plenty. Come on down. We're going places. Dalton takes one side of Olive Street and O'Connor the other. As they approach the corner of Olive and Fourth, they discover to their disgust that the meeting place Dalton thought of on the spur of the moment is obscure. There are three garages at the corner of Fourth and Olive. However, the officers can do nothing about it except keep on the lookout for a young man who might look as though his name was Tom. O'Connor softly calls several passersby by Tom with no success and is about to give up the vain waiting when a tall young man approaches the corner looking up and down the street. O'Connor quickly walks up to him. All right, Tom. Why? Well, my name ain't Tom. Wait a minute, brother. I'm a police officer. I want to talk to you. Hey, Eddie. Come on over here. Okay. Now, uh, what's your name? Bill Smith. How long have you been in town? Me? Not very long. Just up here for a visit. From Texas, I suppose. Yeah. How could you tell? I can't miss that accent. You know many people here? Nobody, hardly. Ain't been here long enough to get acquainted. Ever hear of anyone by the name of, uh... McBride? McBride? No, I don't know anyone with that name. You, uh, working? Not yet. I'm looking for a job, though. Hmm. Well, you must be about broke. Suppose you come down to the station with us and live on the city for a few days. In spite of his protestations of innocence, the man who claims to be Bill Smith is taken in and booked on a vagrancy charge. Later in the afternoon, the cab driver who took the three men from the Olive Street address is located and tells the police that he drove his fares, one of whom appeared to be sick, to the corner of East Fourth and Cumming Street near Hollingbeck Park. Immediately, a force of 300 men under the command of Captains Bernard, Dean, and Wynn is thrown around the neighborhood of the park with instructions to search every apartment house and to inquire of every drugstore for purchases of bandages. Detectives Con Daffer and Hickey enter a drugstore opposite the park. Good afternoon, gentlemen. What could I doing for you? Sold of bandages today. Huh? Bandages? Yeah, so why are you asking? I'm doing the asking, you're answering. If you sold any bandage. Well, first I gotta know where you is. Here's why. You see that? Oh, oh, policeman, there's that different. Now, what could I be doing for you? So you want to know if you sold any bandages and antiseptics this afternoon? Bandages and antiseptics. Hey, just a minute till I look in my book. Yeah, yeah, here it is. To one man, I sold a roll of adhesive tape, a roll of gold, mm. a bottle of carbolic acid, and a bottle of iodine. That ought to be it. What did he look like? Look like? Well, I'll tell you. He didn't look like much or nothing. So how was he dressed? Well, he had on a cap and gray trousers. Did he drive a red Buick? Oh, no, no, he didn't drive anything. About five minutes after he bought the goods, he got on a streetcar out front. He got on a streetcar? Did he still have the packages with him? No. No, he didn't. Why? Then the guy we're looking for must be right close here, Frank. Come on. <laughs> search is centered on the neighborhood in the immediate vicinity of the drugstore. Two apartment houses are entered without success, but the trail goes warm as Hickey and Condaffer interview the landlady of the third. Why, ah, yes, there's a sick man here. I don't know what it is the matter with him. What apartment is he in? By number six, just uh, two doors down the hall. Who's it registered to? Uh, Mr. Grand and his wife. Okay. Come on, Jerry, let's talk to him. Right. Nothing. What do you want? We want to talk to you and Mr. Grant. Well, you can't come in. You slam the door in my face, will you? Come on, Frank. We're going in. Let that guy alone, fellow. Put your hands out your side. 
Haven't you had about enough shooting for today, young fella? Oh, what's that to you? Can't I shoot myself if I want to? Sure, but not policemen. Get that gun. Get under the pillow, Kiki. Okay. Now, watch your name, kid. I ain't done nothing. Nothing wrong, only I'm a parole violator from the state reform school. Now I'll have to go back there. We'll worry about that later. What's your name? Louis Perry. Who's this girl? She's my sister-in-law. She's been trying to fix me up. She ain't done nothing. Maybe she hasn't. We'll we'll take her down to the station with us. What for? You haven't got anything against me. Oh, go on with them, Billy. They can't do do nothing. They can't keep you. Just don't tell them anything. You got nothing to tell them anyway. I shot myself cleaning my gun. That's all. Go on with them, Billy. Oh, all right. I'll get my hat. Just a minute. I'll take a look in that closet before you do. Cleaning your gun, eh, kid? Where are the other boys that were in this job with you? No. So you want to go through the trap alone, huh? The trap? Sure, you killed a copper, didn't you? No, no, I didn't kill a copper. I didn't kill anybody. I swear it's the truth. I'm innocent. Innocent, I tell Yeah, you. and I'm a ballet dancer. Call the ambulance, Jerry, and we'll get this kid to the receiving hospital. <laughs> Perry is taken to the receiving hospital while Billy, the wife of his brother, is brought before Chief Home for questioning. She stoutly denies any knowledge of the bank robbery, claims an alibi for her husband, and states that Louis accidentally shot himself. The questioning goes on for hours. Now, Mrs. Perry, I'm informed that when you first saw the officers at the door of your apartment, you turned and warned somebody inside. Isn't it true that you were warning your husband to make a getaway? No, you're dead wrong. You know that a bank was held up today and that one of the hold-up men was shot. That man was Louis Perry, and we have reason to believe that your husband was in on the deal, too. What did you say to that? Nothing. You're doing the talking. <clears throat> All right. You're wearing two diamond rings on a wristwatch. Where did you get them? My husband gave me one of the rings and the watch. He must have a good job to be able to afford such things. Where does he work? He isn't working now. He had some money saved up before we were married, and he bought these things for me. Where did the other ring come from? (laughs) That's one I knew, copper. I bought it myself for a dollar. Continued questioning of Billy Perry fails to uncover a single enlightening fact regarding the whereabouts of her husband or the identity of the other members of the gang. Louis Perry, questioned at the hospital, is likewise silent. The investigation is checkmated until late that night when the operator at detective headquarters receives a strange phone call. Is this a dick's Hello? office? Yes. examination of the police records shows that Eddie Montijo had been arrested five times on charges of burglary and petty theft. On one of these jobs, Oscar Perry is also implicated. However, there is no record of Tom Bailey. Headquarters immediately teletypes the description of Montijo to all points in California, and two days later, he's arrested in San Diego with a young man named Barkley. Brought back to Los Angeles and told that Perry was under arrest, and that he and Perry had been identified by the bank hold, uh, by, by the hold-up victims... Montijo confesses. Police cannot connect Barclay with the crime. And three days later, a detective is escorting the young man out of the jail to freedom when he suddenly stops. Hey, wait a minute, Captain. I think I see someone I know in this cell. Hi there, Tom. How's the boy? 
Hello, kid. What are you in here for, Tom? Say. Well, I'll be seeing you soon then, huh? Yeah. Come on, Barclay. Okay. Who's your friend? Tom who? Well, it's Tom Bailey. Don't you know him? I thought at first he was in for the same thing Eddie got hooked for. Thus does his friend unwittingly betray Tom Bailey and identify him to the police. For Bailey is the young man who had been arrested by Dalton and O'Connor under the name of Bill Smith. With three of the gang under lock and key, police center the search on Oscar Perry. Failing to develop any case against Perry's wife, she is released. And detectives are assigned to shadow her constantly while the wires to her apartment on East Fork and also to her sister's home in Long Beach are tapped. The officers grouped in Chief Holmes' office have not long to wait for results. Chief Holmes' office. Special operator, Chief. A call has just been placed to that number in Long Beach. Good, let's hear it. I put you on the line. Something good, Chief? I don't know. We'll see. Hello, Billy. Is that you? Yes. Honey, how are you? Fine. Now listen, Sugar. You all stick to what you say. Don't let anyone or anything change your mind. Don't pay no attention to the newspapers. Stick to your story. Want to see me, Sugar? Do I? I've just got to, honey. I'd sure like to hear you say that. You better hang up now, honey. Somebody might be listening in. Call me later, will you? You bet I will. You stick right to that phone. All right. Goodbye, honey. Goodbye, sugar. Operator. Operator. Yes, sir. Where was that call made from? Uh, just a minute, sir. It's come from a pay station on Main Street. What address? I'm sorry, sir. I haven't that information. Why not? Listen here. You, you, you got that information. Well, it'll be too bad for you. I'm very sorry, sir. All I know is that the call come from someplace between 7th and 12th on Main. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? That damn clock. <laughs> she must think I'm a mind reader. Boys, this Perry's uh, playing hide-and-seek with us. I want to go down on... I want you all to go down Main Street and cover every rooming house, restaurant, and cigar store between 7 and 12. Bring in Oscar Perry. And don't come back without him. Detective Jack Trainer, who leads one of the squads of searchers, possesses one clue in the form of a tracing of Perry's handwriting taken from the register of the apartment on Olive Street, where he had registered as M.R. Thomas. A peculiar circle precedes the letter M. Trainer, scanning the registers of the rooming houses, looks constantly for this mannerism of handwriting. Finally, in a rooming house in the 1100 block, he finds the name M.R. Thomas on the book, and the M is preceded by an identical flourish. He questions the landlady about her guest. Uh, who is this M.R. Thomas? Why, a young fellow who just come in. He's in room three. Room three, huh? Where's that? Why, just across the hall. Has he done anything bad? Plenty. You better stay out of the way, ma'am. We may have trouble. All right, boys, let's go. Now, stick him up, Perry. What do you want? First, Commander. Uh, what is this, a surprise party? Yeah, and we bought your present. A nice pair of steel bracelets. No witness of a bank robbery had been close enough to Oscar Perry to positively identify him as a member of the gang. Still, at a show-up a few days later, he was identified as the hold-up man who had robbed the Barbara Cafe of $700 two days after the bank job. Louis Perry, Edward Montijo, and Tom Bailey, positively identified as the bandits, were speedily brought to trial and found guilty of first-degree murder with no recommendations. On July 10, 1925, 
They were executed at San Quentin Penitentiary. Oscar Perry was found guilty of first-degree robbery and given a sentence of from five years to life. Thank you, Chief Davis. An old Western saying is, chock full of good sense. And that saying is this. Pick a good brand and sit tight. What better reason could you have for picking the brand of Rio Grande than that it's predominantly preferred for police and fire equipment wherever Rio Grande is sold? Another reason is that wherever you buy Rio Grande, you can also buy its companion product, Sinclair Oil. Sinclair Opaline gives you the assurance of positive motor protection. Seven extra steps in refining eliminate petroleum jelly and wax, two worthless and harmful properties in oil. Petroleum jelly makes your oil thin and watery in hot summer weather and does not provide the film of oil that protects moving parts from friction. Rio Grande has prepared for your information a complete list of forthcoming cases to be broadcast on Calling All Cars. Drive into your neighborhood Rio Grande service station tomorrow and ask for the Rio Grande radio log. It's free. Please calling all cars. Attention all cars. Cancellation broadcast 39 regarding an attempt bank robbery. Suspects in this case now in custody. That's all. Rolls and